Leading Entrepreneurs of the World 2022. We are joined uh, in our next session by our good friend, Dr. Omar Fisher. He's the founder and CEO of Conscious Wealth. Uh, welcome back, Dr. Omar. Well, it's thank you, Glenn. It's a delight to be here. Your topic today is the future of money and the concept of value creation. Tremendous topic. Let me hand it off uh, to you uh, and do your share screening and we will be ready to roll. Great. So allow me to begin. First of all, welcome wherever you are, morning, midday, evening. And we're gonna spend a few minutes uh, today together to talk about the future of money. We're not gonna try to forecast the concept of uh, Bitcoin or what's gonna happen to any particular cryptocurrency, but we will mention that toward the end, so stay with us. And we also wanna cover in the basics, the concept of value creation. What is our relationship to money? So let's get started. Uh, we're gonna touch on, um, through this agenda, the history of money, the purposes of money, the sweep of money throughout history, creation of value, and I call it new money, what's coming, what's already in your digital wallet and how your business is currently being paid. And we'll talk, as I said, a little bit about cryptos and then wind it up. So first of all, in the chat, put a one if you love money and put a two if, well, you know what? You love other things more than money. And second question is put in the chat a one if you have digital money today, if you're familiar with it, or put a two if actually it's something that might be perplexing to you. And I hope that our talk this morning will make some things very clear. So we begin back about 8,000 years when cowrie shells were the form of money that humans used between themselves. And then what has come up is digital money, as we say here in the 21st century. But we're gonna look back in order to look ahead. And all of the talk this morning has to do with building what I call financial intelligence for you as an individual and you as a business owner or entrepreneur. First thing to understand is that no creature on earth uses money but humans. So why do we use it? What are the functions? Well, it's a unit of measure. It's an exchange value. It uh, helps us exchange other items, goods and services. And some people believe it's a storehouse of value, although in Islamic finance concept, it's not a storehouse of value. We can handle that maybe in questions later on if you're curious. And lastly, I say it's also a mirror of your personal values and societal norms. So what you do with your money, how much, for example, gets donated, et cetera, the giving and taking of money in and out, the cash flow says a lot about who you are and what your values are. So a brief sweep of history, as we said, it starts with the cowrie shells, and then about 3,000 years ago, there stamped coins, starting with copper and bronze, easily available. And later on, it moved into what we call fiat money or paper money when the Chinese uh, discovered how to make paper and put ink on paper. In the 1940s into the 1950s, closer to our time, we had plastic cards and the beginning of coupons, another form of money. And starting in 2009, as you might be aware, was the launch of Bitcoin, and that started a whole new revolution, quite radical in terms of paper currency, which is what we've been used to for decades, into the start of digital money. And what's coming next, I'll call it virtual money. But first, a reminder, and this is a picture here of money about 2,000 years ago in Micronesia. So again, it's, I think, fascinating to see how different tribes and other humans dealt with the concept of the exchanging of value between uh, tribes or between you know, business and others. The uh, point, if we were to now move forward, is there's been a transformation. So money is rapidly shifting from analog to digital, from productization to becoming embedded in other things. 
and from centralized issuers of money, i.e. central banks or governments, to decentralize what we call DeFi. And the DeFi uh, has a lot of advantages, particularly for you as business owners and entrepreneurs, because it brings with it a brand new concept of programmable money. Now let's touch on value creation. Now value creation, as you can see from the diagram, represents value to owners, value to employees, and also to other stakeholders. We call them suppliers, we call them customers, and business success is the nexus between the value created for these others. And clearly if there's a distortion, meaning that the value is created more for the owners, then what you find eventually is that that lack of fairness is spotted by either the employees or by the customers. So a willing owner, sorry, a willing buyer and a willing seller is what creates the value. And any two transactions need not be the same because we said it's a, it's a willing price mechanism. However, we have today more sophisticated marketplaces and we even have capital markets, which then help us to set that value proposition so that the next transaction will be close to, equal to, or maybe if the perception is a loss of value will be below the previous transaction, right? Now, five types of value, and the one we're talking about today is the first one, that's why it's bolded, which is commercial value. And that's where your product or service directly generates a revenue, which we hope is above the expense to produce it, right? So that there's a margin of profit, but commercial value is one type of value. Efficiency value is clearly another type, and market value, we just basically touched on that. That's the exchange value. And then there's a customer value. You've probably heard about that. Uh, and also I would add here, not only the lifetime value of a customer to a business, but there's also the notion of the share of wallet. So that's, that's from the customer's point of view. They have a certain amount of resources, how they perceive the value in your product or service for which they're exchanging willingly fiat money, paper money, or plastic money, or increasingly what I call the new money, which is a form of digital money. And lastly, we have future value. And future value, of course, for the finance buffs in the audience is uh, a kind of calculation. And typically, we learn in business school, it has to do with either the future value compounded effect of the present value, or it's a discounted cash, cash flow from an assumed revenue stream into the future, discounted at some rate to arrive at a net present value. So these five types of values are good to keep in mind when you think about the value creation of your particular business, no matter what size. Now, coming back to the future of money, I see that there is a possible dominant future, which I label 2030 and beyond, right? But first, let's see where we are today. Where is the baseline, so to say, or the point of reference, which is 2022? Well, money value is visible, right? You can look in your wallet, you can look in your purse, uh, and it's tangible for the most part, although that's changing. Second, it is portable within certain borders. But as soon as you cross borders, often there's the issue that comes next, which is the reality of national currencies or foreign exchange. So I live per, uh, presently in Dubai. And, and if I take the Durham and I go to even Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, or I go to America, I've got to exchange my fiat currency, the Durham, for something else. So in that sense, it's not available cross-border. The sole exception are dollars, but then not all foreign uh, nationalities or nations or economies accept dollars as a form of payment, although it is, as we know, a global reserve currency, and we'll come on to that in a minute. 
Now, another point of view uh, on this as to where we are is that we said uh, the value of that money is set typically by central banks, okay? And is uh, uh, adjusted by monetary policy, the expansion of supply and demand uh, and the volume of money available and also using the interest rate pricing mechanism. We said that it's tangible and we need to recognize that a form of money, which is credit, is a scarcity good which has been manufactured by banks. Now, money is deemed to be a public good, and for that reason, it's ruled by monetary policy set by either governments or set by central banks. Now, what about money uh, going into 2030? Well, instead of being visible, it's invisible. It's instantly available across borders. It is uh, characterized, uh, many of us see it as uh, global digital coins. It is programmable, which means the value can be set through, let's call it a smart contract or by negotiation between the buyer and seller, the value at the moment of the exchange. And where do we see that? In the digital world, the virtual world, the NFTs, the non-fungible tokens, the value is set at the moment. It is weightless. It's all about data and information rather than being physical. Credit is abundant and can be bartered. And it is having certain uh, characteristics, what I call this new money, I call it personal currency. And lastly, we see through the DeFi that the future of money is a bifurcating into a public good and also a private good. And I think we'll see more and more of the private good when you visit metaverse. So what are the permutations that we might say uh, could occur with this so-called new money? Well, it could be Bitcoin, could be the altcoins like Ethereum and others. It could uh, evolve as stable coins, some of which we see now, tokens, we just mentioned the NFTs and metaverse is coming rapidly as uh, a place where business uh, needs to hang out and needs to be seen and possibly uh, needs to take advantage of a commercial transaction within the metaverse. And my question then is, what kind of money are you going to use? So let's stop and ask a question. Maybe you could put it in the chat. How do you see the metaverse? and your particular business, how do you expect to transact money transactions from your business in the metaverse? Just uh, jot down a few words or phrases, we, we'd love to hear from you. And for those of you that are seeing this in a replay, you can drop us a note. And again, we'd love to hear from your, uh, your point of view and opinion as well. Just a quick word, as I promised about crypto, and of course, it's been a huge gyration in the past two to three weeks. The overall cryptocurrency market has lost about $2 trillion in market value. And one hallmark, which is rather tragic, is a so-called stablecoin, Luna, dropped 98% of its value, evaporating $40 billion in market value in less than 24 hours. So new money has certain risks that we haven't seen before and a volatility, I would argue that we haven't seen either in terms of the magnitude of the change, both up and guess what, also regrettably going down. But it's important to realize that it's here to stay. And so this is something that I would recommend the listeners pay attention to, particularly on a personal level and also as a business owner for your particular business, how are you going to interact with uh, coins, digital coins, and receive payments and make settlements uh, of your uh, suppliers? We recognize there are 300 million people today that own cryptocurrencies. And up until recently, I don't have the data from this week, is 112 billion is traded daily. 65% of these 300 million seem to own a piece of Bitcoin. However, the value has declined significantly over the last five months, as we know, from a high of 60 
9,000 per coin to something bouncing between 25 and 30. And no, I don't have an idea whether it's gonna recover or how long it will take, or is it gonna actually go lower? But my point in this presentation is just a caution that in our relationship to money, we cannot assume that whatever we invest in or whatever we choose as a saving vehicle is always gonna increase in value. So do your due diligence, consult with experts and improve your financial intelligence. There's over 20,000 cryptos that have been issued since 2009. Recognize that between six and 800 are no longer with us. Either they went bankrupt or they were hacked and the value disappeared. In some cases, as a clarification, the hacking and the cybersecurity breach was not of the coin itself on the blockchain, but rather the exchanging of the coins with a crypto exchange where your wallet is exposed. So again, this is a risk factor that we don't have with fiat money in our purse or our pocketbook. And lastly, I'm told that there are over 18,000 businesses today that accept uh, cryptocurrencies. Of course, one of the most uh, visible um, is uh, Tesla, but there are many others now that are willing to accept your coins um, in whatever shape for settlement of goods and services. So my question to you as a takeaway question is how much do you really understand today about your relationship to money, the basis of money, how money is uh, changing and transforming. And lastly, how is your business uh, positioned to either take advantage of or to get on board or, or maybe to adjust to the new realities of digital money? So just a couple of more uh, slides to finish up. I'd like for you to consider uh, some of the money values that we take into our future. And part of what we touched on with the tribal use of money is a sharing economy. And what's also been called a gift economy, whereby basically the treatment of people who have capital with people who have less capital is a sharing of that which is unlike our well familiar capitalist system. There's no renting of money. There's no lending of money. It's more a sharing of goods and services. You may in the States have read about the Amish people for, for one close to home example in Pennsylvania that uh, God forbid, but if there happens to be a barn or a business that burns down, what happens? They don't come with buckets of money for the, the people who have been afflicted, what they do is they bring the lumber, their hammers, their nails, and they rebuild whatever it was was burned. That's a sharing economy. The chief goal is not solely a material gain, okay? Uh, but rather it's community. And, I, and I'm really curious to see to what extent the metaverse is able to create these pockets of communities and a sense of collective development moving humanity forward, rather than having money to be the master where the capitalists become more wealthy. And, and no point going through the concentration of wealth today and income inequality, that data is well available and you're probably known, uh, know about it. Instead, it's important to understand that money is a servant. It's better for you to understand and to control your relationship to money. And I would suggest that we do so in a way that uplifts many in our community, of course, starting with our family, our neighbors, our friends, et cetera. It's also important, I believe, increasingly, we need transparency. And of course, we spoke about the risk of cybersecurity and uh, these digital exchanges. So that's a topic that, that needs to be addressed and we carry forward into the new reality around digital money. There needs to be simplicity and ease of understanding, which can help with financial inclusion because it's of little uh, help 
in, in, a, in an era of sustainability and the importance of reaching out through our businesses to our customers, to our community, if we're leaving whole segments of the community uh, unbanked, for example. And I'm told there's about 1.2 billion people today on the planet that do not yet have a bank account and don't participate in the formal banking system. And lastly, what we wanna take into the future is uh, flexibility. So programmable money and a sharing economy go together, which gives more power to the individual and rewards your, cre your creativity and your ideation that's of value to you, your business and your community. So there are unanswered questions, which I leave you to think about. So when money becomes fully data, who owns it? And how do they own it? How do you express your ownership over bits and bytes that show up in your phone or on some statement? And where is the value of money stored? And then who has access to that? It's okay to say my money is in a cryptocurrency, it's on the blockchain, but how do you have access to it? And there are risks associated with you know, losing a digital password, for example, which cannot be uh, replicated. What about exclusive rights to private property if your money is actually private? And what about the government's uh, use of money as a good in order to collect taxes and then spread it out to, to the citizens. Another very important question, since there was really little or no credit before the 16th century, and now it has ballooned in the 19th and 20th century to be in the trillions of dollars, we're awash in debts and personal loans. So how is credit gonna be allocated in the digital economy? Are interest rates needed? as I shared with you earlier, as a pricing mechanism for determining the rental value of money. Are there gonna be any checks and balances on the government's ability to issue the digital coins? And we, we heard just a couple of months ago that the G7 are planning to have each of the central banks issue a CBDC, central bank digital coin, in each of the main seven and maybe all 20 of the leading economies. And so what's gonna be the check and the balance on the volume of digital coins that will come out from the central bank? And also we need to look eventually at what is the role of the US dollar, which has played a, a critical uh, global reserve currency role since the Bret Wood conference um, in the turn of into the 19th century. So these are some unanswered questions that you may wanna reflect on. In conclusion, we've said money is a human construct. It's really a set of values. And the value granted to money changes over time and over the epochs. The future of money, 2030 and beyond, is likely to be instant, digital, and invisible. So get ready. Massive lack of awareness and financial intelligence, unfortunately, characterizes many of our societies today. And that's why I'm delighted to present today and to be part of, of this uh, entire session leading entrepreneurs worldwide. Money exchange is central to commercial and business transactions. So again, you've heard me, I urge you, get ready for digital money in your business and strive to create enduring value for your customers. And I suggest becoming more familiar with what I call conscious leadership and ultimately conscious capitalism, which John Mackey wrote about in a beautiful book in 2015, sometime prior. So in closing, allow me to quote from the well-known Albert Einstein. Learning is the beginning of wealth. Searching and learning is where the miracle process all happens. The great breakthrough in your life comes when you realize you can learn anything. You need to learn and accomplish any goal you set for yourself. This means there are no limits as to who you can be, 
who, what you can have or what you can do. So God bless. Enjoy the rest of the conference. And I'm done, Glenn. All right, Dr. Omar, thank you. Thank you. Excellent as always. I, I loved I loved your concept. Money is the is a servant for the betterment of good. That we should all we should all keep that in mind. And I can't help, you know, I'm a classic movie fan. So every time you said invisible, I know you're doing Claude Rains proud, the original <laughs> invisible man, right? <laughs> out, out, outstanding, outstanding job as always. Listen, thank you for joining us again. Uh, there it is. There it is. Invisible. It's gone. It's gone. Uh, <laughs> look forward to seeing you next time. Fabulous talk again today. Great content. State of the art as always. Dr. Omar, thank you. God bless. Be, be, stay safe. Be well. Thank you. Thank you.